Linda Abbott. I'm the manager of Veterans Social and Homeless Services for the city of St. Petersburg. And with me today is Mayor Bill Foster, which homelessness is one of his top five strategic issues for his term. Robert Marbot is, our, is the past CEO and founder of Haven for Hope, a 17-acre multi-building campus in San Antonio, Texas, that provides a holistic community for those who are homeless. He is here to assist our community in creating a successful action plan to address the needs of people who are homeless. Homelessness is such a complex issue that many cities around our nation are facing. And we wanted to provide our viewing audience with important information as we launch into an educational campaign to the citizens of St. Petersburg. This segment is the second in a series of three that we plan to present. And today we're going to continue our discussion on issues that we face here in St. Petersburg and some of our move forward plans. Mayor Foster has stated that we can do better. We can do better than a cardboard box on a hard sidewalk. We can do better than what we have been doing and that has become our theme for these segments. We can do better. With that said, I'd like to ask Dr. Marbot to start us off with some of the misconceptions about homelessness. Well, I, I think, you know, as we've talked before, there, there are three really big misconceptions or myths, if you will, about homeless. One is who the homeless are. Uh, the second is homeless doesn't cost you anything. As a society, it, it, it's just over there and you don't need to engage it. And the third is you can't do anything about it. And the, in order to, to really address homeless, you need to understand who the homeless are. And if you think of the homeless as the traditional middle-aged person, a, predominantly a guy underneath the bridge, if you think that's your model of homelessness or the person on the street corner panhandling, you're never gonna get there in terms of solving the problem because homeless is a lot more complex. Uh, in across the United States, the grow, there are two growing segments of homeless, veterans connected to the, the recent wars in the Middle East and domestic violence triggered uh, women-led households. And so, and those are very much not sort of talked about. You don't sit, you don't think about them and, and, and we need to think about that because the triggers for those two groups are very, very different. So how you handle uh, a post-traumatic or an acute traumatic veteran is very different than the economic issues and security and safety issues connected to a domestic violence situation. So if you really understand that, that homelessness is a lot more complex, it's not monolithic, it will help you as you start to develop your strategies. And also, Robert, isn't it families too? Fa Aren't we seeing a lot more families? And, and especially in Pinellas County, yeah. families and children, and, and families with children in Pinellas County is the single fastest growing group here in, in our county right here. And, and so you wouldn't ever want to treat a family the same way you would treat a veteran mm -hmm. or, or, a, or a chronic male off the, underneath the bridge. There are three, each of those require three different techniques, so it's very important to understand that. Um, the cost issue is you know, phenomenal. We've been doing a lot in the last uh, a few weeks here, right here in this county, trying to identify the frequent flyers, if you will, the folks with the, the most costly who are, who are going through the jail and prison system, who are going through the public defenders and the state attorney's office and through the police departments and through the agencies and through the emergency rooms. And we're just with the starting to see phenomenally high amount of expenditures on a very small group of people and that is true nationwide uh, many cities have found uh, Denver Philadelphia DC their top 10 folks uh, whoever the top 10 service you know users are all at over a million dollars and that is pretty normal that is not an abnormal number that's a pretty regular number across the country and we're starting to see that here in, in, in Pinellas mm -hmm. County and, and so if you stop and say, we, this is not an important issue, this is what's so great with what the mayor has done by saying, you know, this is an issue we need to get after and we need to do. You can't just sit on the side. And, it, and it's not just what happens visually, it's not just what happens in your parks, it's what happens to bring down your cost. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a drain on the police department, it's a drain on the state attorneys, it's a drain on the public defenders, it's a drain on agencies. And so if you don't start getting successful and get some people graduating out, it costs the, the county money and it costs not just the county and the cities on the taxpayer side but it also counts the United Ways and your social service agency which then takes money uh, from other things. It's and also a drain medically because 
the uh, the homeless person who is sick on the streets, their first responder is a paramedic. It's an ambulance, and mm -hmm. uh, when, when they may just have food poisoning because they ate something bad from a handout on the street, they end up in the hospital. And so it's a huge drain on our medical health care system. It's a, train, a drain on my sanitation department because we have to consistently go and, and clean up all of the uh, debris that are handed out to homeless people that not even the homeless person would want. So um, there are drains everywhere in, in parks and recreation. Uh, we have to constantly replace restroom facilities uh, due to uh, the destruction of many of these public facilities that would be open late into the evening. So uh, we see that also the economic impacts that it has on the businesses um, is, a, is a constant strain. Uh, truly uh, pedestrians uh, going ingress and egress into a business, they don't want to see that visual uh, part of our society that uh, it, it's just a hard look. So uh, there are costs all the way around and it's uh, multiplying daily. And, and you're right about the ER is really the highest cost because you, you, you will generally have a first responder hit and then you'll have the, the EMT, EMS fire rescue hit. And so sometimes it's a police officer, sometimes it's the fire truck. And then it's the EMS unit. So now we have two or three units on site. And then they get transported to an emergency room. So you have the most expensive part of our medical system providing food, po you know, dealing with food poisoning or, or, or dealing with, you know, uh, something on a really simpler level, really a basic health need level. And so it's a real waste into the medical system, the whole medical right. system. You know, I just want to jump in for a minute here to go back to the agencies. Uh, 211 Tampa Bay Cares um, provides our data system uh, for all the folks uh, who are homeless and as well as other social service providers. And we have been able to go back to 2004 and track an individual who has been in and out of our homeless systems since then, in and out. And, and really never finding you know, self-success or, or self-sufficiency. And so really talk about a waste of uh, staff time, you know, agency's time. We really have never helped that individual because she just keeps rotating through our, our system and we're really not uh, helping her by gaining any kind of self-sufficiency. So there are costs everywhere that people just don't, I think, realize. Tens of thousands of dollars on, on an individual person and when, when you think of the, the numbers, whether it's medical, whether it's going in and out of treatment, whether it's the criminal justice system, they're into six figures. I mean, we, we could have easily have purchased that person a house for the kind of money that we're talking about, and yet they're still on the street. And, and, and so not on one side, you're wasting money as a community, and then on the other, you're not helping the person right. that we're trying to help. And yep. so on both sides of the right. measurement, right. whether it's what can we do better to help that individual or what can we do better as a financial, you know, prudent system, both sides are failing. And, and that's starting to change. And that's the good news is, you know, the third myth is a lot of people think that homeless has always been here, we can always do that. And there's about a dozen cities across the country that have been phenomenally successful in dropping overall ho street homelessness as well as homeless across the board. And St. Pete's going to be one of them. Yes. And it's already happened. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we, you know, to date we've had about a 50% drop in virtually all measurements of, of homelessness in the downtown area, whether you measure right around City Hall, you measure the greater, the greater area, you measure in the parks. Some of the numbers are over 50% right now. I mean, the park number... Uh, homeless as I've been looking at the three major parks, you know, Williams and, and Mirror Lake and Unity, those numbers, uh, we're at about 20% of where we were when we started all these efforts in October. The overall street numbers is a little over half drop downtown. Wow. And then right around the city hall area is, is more like 75%. So, so we're getting success. We're not there yet and, right. we're, and, we're, and, and we're well on our way and we can do better. And it, but but in other cities have found this too. You know, I was just in San Antonio over the weekend, and our number two years ago on street was a little over fifteen hundred, fifteen hundred and eight, I think, was the number. Our number measured two weeks ago in the national point of time that was it was released two weeks ago is under a hundred. Wow. And so you know, thousand five hundred to less than than a hundred, and so and we're already starting to see those drops here by just having the system all work together. Well, and uh, just to drill down a little bit farther on those numbers, 
um, when Safe Harbor opened, we were, last year at this time and during the winter months, we ran anywhere between 160 and 190 people sleeping within a 1.5 mile radius of the downtown core area. Um, when Safe Harbor opened in January, that number quickly fell to about 120. And we've been staying right about there. And last week, we were down to 87. So it's working. It is working, and we just need to continue to be diligent and work with uh, the Safe Harbor, work with all the other agencies, and all the other partners that we've been developing over the past eight, 10 months. Yep, and we just have to disrupt the cycle and um, encourage people to uh, not only become ex or access themselves to the system and uh, to the help that we offer, but uh, try to re reunify families. And I know we've had successes mm -hmm, we have. in mm -hmm. getting people off the streets back into uh, a family setting. And, and that's encouraging as well. That's uh, my ultimate goal is self-sufficiency and reunification of the family. And if, they, if people will just access the, the, the programs that we have, uh, there's no reason people can't be successful. Then it becomes a choice. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, one of the examples just last Friday, well, one of the, if, if you go to the park, you would know the individual. And, you know, and for confidentiality, you probably shouldn't name the individual. But he's a person who had had two carts, I mean, full to the top, and, and everybody knows him. I mean, everybody in the system knows him. The police know him, the fire rescue know him, the emergency rooms know him, the, the business people know him. And uh, uh, through some direct engagement uh, of your staff, uh, was out at Safe Harbor last Friday and last night, you know, five days later, he's still there. And he was in classes. And I, I mean, I was shocked, I, you know, when I was out there. It, 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 what a success to see him engaging. I mean, uh, is he there now? No, but, but he's, well, he's taken the first four or five steps now. And in, in, it, this is really becomes an individual level thing. If you can help each person figure out their path and customize their, their game plan to get off the street, that's where the real success goes. And so if you deal with it at a real human level, you start getting one success and another success. And this is a person who probably had the most stuff of anybody I've ever seen pretty much anywhere in the country. And now he's out at Safe Harbor. And so, it, and he's getting help. That's great, great news. Um, I don't know where, where, where you want to go. You want to go through the, the initial part of the report? or yeah, is why, that don't you, you? why don't you tell us a little bit about your report yeah. that you've been writing for us, Robert? We're about halfway through the report, and I found four different areas, and maybe just, I'll just summarize them and then maybe go deep into each of them. One is we need to get system level improvements. We need to improve the connective tissue between these agencies. This is a very system rich community. And as we get into it, we're finding that, that there's a lot of financial resources available in this community that candidly aren't available in other places. And so we need, there's a lot of money being spent. So is it being spent well? Is it being spent strategically and thoughtfully and, and, and in a connective system-wide use? So one is how do you improve the overall system? Uh, the second is dealing with really families and children. I mean, we really have some major issues going on with family and children in, in, in this county. And I know you've been involved with several of those uh, groups really getting after that. Uh, the third is uh, Pinellas Hope and Pinellas Safe Harbor. Um, two really interesting things. Those two programs have now brought about 800 place, you know, beds or mats or, or placements online here in the last two to three years. Uh, Pinellas Safe Harbor didn't exist uh, five months ago. It didn't exist. And now there's about 400, almost 400 people living there every night. And 85% of those people were on the street the night before they checked into Safe Harbor. That's an amazing number. So you got about 330 people who the night, be whenever they got into the harbor, whether it's through a direct engagement by the police department, direct engagement by agency, voluntary walk-in, church referral, whatever you have, that over 85% were on the street the night before. And what a jump from going from the street to a place with services and security and safety and being able to sleep and eat right and get nutrition and start the classes and, and, and programming. And so- and, and, and touch on that because I don't know that the, the viewers really understand the impact that poor nutrition and sleep deprivation have 
on, on just the human condition. I think that's a big deal. It is. It, 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 and I really, you know, I say this a lot because everybody focuses on the alcohol and drugs. And one of the things we've seen at Safe Harbor is actually a major reduction in drinking. And because I think a lot of people on the street drink and drug in order to go to sleep at night. It, it, it's like their version of a Ambien, a sleeping pill or, or what have you. And getting sleep and sleep deprivation on the street is such a major problem. And I personally think it's way more a problem. But I think it's more problem than alcohol and drugging. And I think the alcohol and drugging is actually the reason to get to sleep. So what we found at Safe Harbor, really amazing phenomenon. When we opened it up, we said, all right, mats are not going to be, we, you can't go to sleep till 10 o'clock. And we were thinking, all right, and then at 10, we're going to have lights shutting down and such. After two nights there, and, and we got, and back then when we opened, it was a little cold, and so we had actually the heater going and such. We had people, can I have my mat right after dinner? And people were ready to go to sleep. In the first few nights, we said, okay, let you, let you take the mat out about seven or eight o'clock. People were going to sleep at seven or eight o'clock and not waking up till the next morning till seven. And initially, because they had been so sleep deprived for so long. And if you don't get that, that sleep, and then combine that with nutrition, and being able to get a real steady meal of non, if, if, you, if you're eating out of dumpsters, if you're eating out of back re of restaurants, you're getting a high carb, high fat, and you're not getting nutrition, you're not getting the, the protein, you're not getting the vitamins. And so the combination of those two, how in the world would you ever go to a job training class? How in the world, we couldn't concentrate right. Right. on a computer. We couldn't s survive. And so the ability uh, to fix those two not only improves them on more work of getting into the workforce, but it drops the drugging and alcohol. Uh, and that's what, and I think a lot of people didn't quite understand that about how Safe Harbor was going to work, that, 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 that is drinking is coming down way, way down for, for I'd say about 80% of the folks who probably used to drink every single day are not drinking every day. They, they may drink once a week, you know, and a lot of people will drink a glass of wine or whatever, but these are not folks, they used to get drunk to go to sleep. They don't need that anymore. And that's really made a change, it combined with what the churches are doing. And the, and the really the faith-based uh, community is really stepped up now and is starting to provide every nightly meal. We still would like, you know, weekend brunches and, and breakfasts, but, but it's a start. And the faith-based community coming along is, has been fabulous. And you know, I think the fact that folks can have a shower every day, have a hot shower every day, and use toilet and brush their teeth, I mean, that right there has so much to do with uh, all the self stuff. Right. Uh, and so those are the things that people are getting right now at Safe Harbor, as well as Pinellas Hope and some of the other agencies yeah. around, around our community. And, and those magnets, um, they're, 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 they're magnets to draw folks, people in. If you will, they're the marketing feature to get you, get, get you in. But they're the most basic of, of necessities. And as you move up sort of Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, when you get up to the top two or three levels, that's where you become employable and you can be job. But if, if you don't have access to a shower in nutrition, if you don't brush your teeth for four or five weeks and then you come off and you're trying to get a job with an employer, how in the world would you get a job? You know, how, you know, if you're not, you know, your, your hair clean and such. And, and we already are seeing people at Safe Harbor just transform. The, one of the very first guys, well, he was actually the first person to check in and saw him last night. He has a job now. And now he's still working, he's still living at Safe Harbor. He's trying to get enough money built up so he has two or three months for his his deposit mm -hmm. and for his you know last month the rent and he doesn't want to move too quickly because he doesn't want to go back he says right now I have a group of people who support me and keep me out of the drinking and drugging and so he, he's well on his way and and he's one of the people if you would sit there and take a you know bet and say I'm not sure this guy's gonna make it and this guy's going yeah. to make it yeah. and, and and he's already well on his way Good. yeah that's a great story yeah yeah uh, the, the last thing is we need individual agencies to improve, you yeah. know, and, and you need the system to improve, but you need each individual agency to improve. And, 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 and this may be one, of, this may be the final step. It may be after the restructuring of the system and the re -put, putting together the system, but we need every agency to really 
do a self-assessment, and, and, and I don't mean a gigantic bureaucratic audit and something that, mm -hmm. that actually wastes time and it takes time, but a step back, do a peer review, compare yourself to the national practices, and do you have a place that, I, I use look, feel, and smell. I mean, when you walk in, does this look transformable? Does this look like a home? Does this look like, it, it's still gonna be an institution, you know, in, in most cases. But does it look nice? Does it look respectful? Is it, does it create dignity for the individual? Or is it a dingy, grungy, dark, dirty, you know, with, you know, and I've been to some places that, you know, have, you know, dead critters and corners and stuff like that. And that doesn't create transformation. And so we need every agency to go in and say, how do we spruce ourselves up? You know, bleach and paint go a long way. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, and we're not talking about massive reconstruction projects. It's talking about, uh, you know, you know, clean and, and health. And I know the mayor has some ideas about a program that you might be doing later this fall where you go into the agencies right. and such. Um, and, and that will do so much to help those individual agencies. And then their systems need to improve. They need to say, all right, is this working or not working? And look at your peer. You have some of the, the best service rich environment in, the, in this county, and you have some programs like HEP and Salvation Army that are doing incredibly successful, who, who, who the rest of us can learn from, and, and how do you improve that system? How do you create that transformational process? Because in the end, you can't build your way out of these. No city can. And it, it's not cost effective, and in tight times, you don't have the money to do that. So the way you improve it is if each individual agency can get a 10 or 15% better graduation rate, either in terms of more graduates or in graduates coming out faster, still get the same success, but do it maybe three weeks faster. Uh, and, and that will actually give you the room and capacity. And, and, and I know there's always a myth when you do services, more people are gonna come to town. And, and we've studied that in other cities. And, the, and the, there's a generally a little bump up. Uh, it's very, very little. But the improvement is so big, the net improvement is way out, out does that. And San Antonio did a really good statistical analysis of this in last year and found that there was a 7% improvement of people who came in from the outside. It's not nearly, it's, an, it's almost anecdotal. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody talks about thousands of people coming. It just doesn't happen. But the overall improvement in the system was 49%. So the net total was a 42%. So in order to get system improvement, you got to add the, you got to get the services right. And I'm not necessarily saying add services, but they need to be strategically aligned. You need to integrate your services better. And then you need to improve your individual uh, service level. And that's how you get out of this. Because if you try to build out, you, you, if you yeah. try to build out and spend huge amounts of capital dollars, and don't have the, the spending the smart operational dollars, it's a waste of money. Yeah, and what I like about what you bring to the table, you're looking at not only San Antonio, but best practices around the entire country. Mm -hmm. And I also like the way, you know, you use words about facilities, look, smell, feel, you know, you talk about dignity, you talk about uh, families and children and, and individual needs, and, and this is so complex and what I want to make sure that everyone stays on the same page with me is that we, were ta we are talking about real human beings, real human life, and they deserve, regardless of their circumstances now, they still deserve that human dignity. They, they deserve that, that compassionate care. And um, I think that's what we're seeing from the people of Pinellas County, the faith-based organizations, law enforcement. I'm hearing a lot of praises from the officers on the street that they're truly sincerely trying to help but they are they're still getting compliments you, you know you, you you have to come with us uh, but they're doing it in such a heartfelt way and uh, and and really showing demonstrating a true concern for for the human being the human life I think that goes a long way when you treat people with care and compassion I totally agree, and and a little bit back to the the agencies. Uh, those of us in the homeless arena, we are working very hard to make our systems more efficient, and and to come out with a better product, uh, just so we can meet those needs of individuals who who want their dignity and their self respect and self sufficiency. Yeah. Slowly, we're coming out of this economy, and I do believe that agencies will be able to to help people get back on their feet a little bit more quickly than we have in the past couple of years, because. 
quite honestly, jobs have been hard to get in St. Petersburg and Pinellas County, but we're slowly starting to see, you know, come out of that. So we, we are on our way. And, and we have so many folks in our county here that weren't prepared. If the job was there, they're not prepared. They're not prepared either on the skill side or the hygiene side or the personal responsibility side. And that's what this transformation and in, in, in real dignity approach does. And when you look at the, you know, like these individuals who came in on the first day, you, you were there checking in, helping us check in people that first day. Many of those folks have actually moved on and have gotten jobs. One guy went off, uh, went and got a, a almost a six-digit job uh, out of the, the safe harbor. Wow. And he started out in one small job, and then he did another job, and he was actually running two jobs. And this employer picked him up and moved him out of state. He was so good. And so it, 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 we're, we're starting to see those, and it starts with treating the person with dignity, mm -hmm. just the way we would like to be, you know, do you look them in the eyes? Do you, you know, do you give them a hug? Do you, right. do you, do, do you, do you touch them? And a lot of people, for homeless people, it's to go like this and don't want to look at their eyes and, and don't shake hands and, and what have you, and that is so important. And, and the faith-based community has really stepped up, and they are really, uh, all the way down to just serving meals I've, I've seen such an incredible, both an increase of organized and a better way to, to, to actually feed now. And uh, where feeding gets aligned with services, which is a really critical component. Because if you don't line feeding with services, you got your magnets in the wrong places. And, and folks are coming in. I, I was out with St. Vinny's and, and uh, also at Safe Harbor just in the last week. And it's interesting how many of the individuals, homeless people, have come up after the meal and come up and have thanked the person serving. And they said that used to not happen that much. Nice. And now people are coming up and people are feeling this is, there's a different, there's a new sheriff in town. There's a new way to do this. And it's really working. It's already, the, the, but you look at the measurements of, of law enforcement, 49% booking rate down, you know, down. That That's just a tremendous financial, you know, we're starting starting to hear the emergency rooms are starting to feel, you know, less. We still have work to do in, in, in the, the medical care side of this. Um, and the street feeding has really dropped. You know, it used to be you would have a meal, uh, it, you know, you and I were out in the uh, Williams Park, you know, sort of the anchor, you know, that's almost the bellwether. And it used to be you'd have five or six meals there all day long. And I sat, I was in the park the, all day that one day not one meal came through. And I asked some of the people there, and they said, well, we had a meal here yesterday afternoon across the street in a parking lot. And that's the improvement. You're not saying don't serve. You're saying we need to serve in a logical, smart way. And you need to serve where the job training is. You need to serve where the showers are. You need to serve where the agencies are, where they can engage the individual rather than the sort of haphazardness that, that may have been going on before. It's going to help. Yeah. Great. Mayor, as we await Robert's final draft um, and his action plan, what can our citizens do to help? Well, we need to relocate the street feeding to Safe Harbor and Pinellas Hope. I think that's the main thing. Stop that enabling process, and we're looking at ways that we can do that. But as Robert said, uh, you just encourage those that are doing the street feeding, those that are the enablers, encourage them to, to feed at Pinellas Hope or the Safe Harbor, and that's uh, certainly going to be a, a continued part of the education process. We also want our citizens to volunteer with a homeless partner, either financially or otherwise, uh, use their time, talents, and support these agencies that embrace the transformation process. We will have more to do after Robert finishes his final report. We will, and I, I just want the viewing audience to know that uh, I am I'm currently working on educational material, and it will soon go to print, and we will have have them by the thousands, so you can know where to take your your time and your talent and your and your food uh, to help the agencies who are already have the expertise to uh, assist individuals. So be looking for those rat cards; they'll be hitting your street corner soon. Um, I would like to thank uh, both of you for joining us today. We have made many strides, I believe, over the last eight months since uh, Dr. Marvin has been here, but there's still a lot to do, and we know that, and uh, we still can do better. Mm -hmm.